1450 FM 99.3 KNSI. Welcome to another edition of Your Health, a brand new program here on KNSI that features local health experts from Centricare. Now, I stress that word local because these people are your neighbors. They're folks that you see all the time at the school with the kids, the grocery store. They live and they work right here in central Minnesota. I think that's very important because these people know firsthand about the various health issues that affect you because they are also impacted by these same factors. They just happen to be healthcare professionals that work at Centricare. For example, Dr. Troy Payne is a neurologist. Good morning, Dr. Payne. Good morning. And you have been a neurologist working here for 22 years, you said. 22 years in central Minnesota. What made you decide that uh, this is what you wanted to do, neurology and perhaps to specialize in sleep disorders? I was really interested in epilepsy, too, and the relationship between seizures and people's sleep. And that sort of led me down the path toward sleep. And, I, geez, I've been doing sleep medicine now for over two decades. Well, and, and it's something that you would think that people, you know, it's like falling off a log, right? Uh, pretty easy. It happens to us all the time. Everybody knows about sleep, but I bet we really don't, do we? Oh, the modern society uh, <laughs> life uh, style messes everything up, including sleep. Well, let's go back to what our mom always said. How much sleep should we have? It depends on your age. You know, a baby may get 20, 22 hours of sleep a day. Mm -hmm. By the time you're an average adult, most people need about seven to eight hours a night. All right. And conversely, as soon as you're a new mom or dad, forget about sleeping. Absolutely, because those kids, they keep you up at night. Jobs keep you up. There's lots of things that keep people up at night. Now, why is it so important that we get enough sleep? If you don't get enough sleep, All the modern science is showing there's an increased risk of car accidents and diabetes and weight gain and heart disease. So all these things that we talk about that we're trying to avoid get worse when you don't get enough sleep. What happens to our bodies while we sleep? When you sleep, you actually regenerate a lot of the things that go wrong with us during the daytime. So, for instance, there's a chemical that we throw off called adenosine during the daytime, and it builds and builds up the longer we're awake. And you got to stick that adenosine back into the system again in order to regenerate your batteries for the next day. Now, you can block that adenosine with caffeine, but that only goes so far. Uh, Eventually, you just got to go to sleep. And when you sleep, that adenosine gets put back where it's supposed to be, so you're refreshed when you wake up the next morning. How about doctors? We always see, whether it's uh, you know in Hollywood or what have you, The doctors, especially when they're in their residency, it's famous. You don't ever get any sleep. Well, when I was a resident way back in the dark ages in the 1980s, we that was actually true. What you just said, that's pretty true. It's how we did things. Actually, we have changed residencies hugely in the last 10 years because there were accidents that people were having driving home the next day and all kinds of other things. And in the modern era where we try to, as much as possible, try to get rid of every single error that can be possibly ever avoided in medicine, one of the things is to have your doctor be refreshed, alert, and paying attention to you. Yeah, That sounds silly uh, to think uh, that that wasn't always the case, but I think in the old days it was, you know, tough it out, man up. Right. And these days it's go to bed, get some sleep, come back refreshed. Mm-hmm. Makes perfect sense. I know that if I have a doctor's appointment, I would rather have it be seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning as opposed to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It's true. You'll also get into your appointment time quicker, too. <laughs> um, wh- when it comes to sleep, uh, does our body need it as much as our mind, or does the mind need it more? Both. Uh, Your gut needs it, your heart needs it, your brain needs it. Everything that we have has a circadian rhythm to it. There's a rhythm to wakefulness and sleep and how different hormones are secreted. For instance, growth hormone is mostly secreted in deep sleep in teenagers. They actually grow more in their sleep, Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas thyroid hormone is secreted at a different time of the day. Hmm. So everything in our system has its own little clock. How long has it taken science, medical science in particular, to find out all of these things about what happens when we sleep. And I would imagine you may be just scraping the surface. Well, we've been doing this for a hundred years now. So a lot of the stuff we've known for a long time, the big research difference has been now we know how important it is not to mess it up because we're messing it up more now than we ever have. I have heard that when someone sleeps, their mind kind of the brain gets cleaned out. 
and and some of the bad stuff that's up there gets carried away. Is that true? That is true. And if you don't get enough sleep at night, there has actually been several studies recently that have shown that there is an increased chance of memory problems, confusion the next day. And I think we've all experienced that. But if it goes on for years and years and years, some of the new research is suggesting that there's an increased risk of dementia when you get older that's irreversible. Again, how much sleep do we need? Seven to eight hours a night. Seven to eight hours. And kids need more. More, especially our teenagers who often are working jobs or playing football practice or getting up very early for swim practice Mm -hmm. and are not getting enough sleep on the schedule that a teenager needs. Well, Doc, do you have conversations with student athletes and perhaps their parents and maybe even their coaches at times about these kids getting up at the crack of dawn to go to hockey practice or wherever? In the Minnesota Sleep Society, we're actually recommending that we follow what's now becoming more and more the norm that schools shouldn't open their doors before 8.30 in the morning in high school for high school students. You can open your doors before 8.30 in the morning, but if you do, you will have more car accidents in the parking lot of the school. You'll have more truancy. You'll have more depression. And there are some studies out there showing an increased risk of depression and suicide if you open your doors before 8.30 in the morning. Of course, if you choose to go to swim or hockey practice at 6.30 or 5.30 in the morning, that's a choice. You make, but it's not a very good choice for some people. Now, there are morning people who do just fine, but on average, most teenagers like to go to bed about 11 and get up around 9, and uh, getting to school by 8.30 can be a chore, much less getting to school at 6.30. You know, I am one of those people, uh, I am not a morning person, and yet I've been doing morning radio ever since I can remember, right up at 2.45. That can't be very good for a person, can it? No, you're fighting against your own natural rhythm, and eventually you end up paying for it. I always find it interesting, though, people that when they retire, do they keep the schedule that they kept while they were working all these years, or do they revert back to what they thought would be their schedule? Well, You sort of get a hint of that when you go on vacation as to whether you switch or not. One of the biggest problems we have in people who have to get up really early for shift work, like you, is you don't get enough sleep. Shift workers, by and large, tend to get less sleep than someone who works a regular first shift. And then that gets into not enough sleep and all the penalties for it. Our guest is Dr. Troy Payne. He's a neurologist with CenterCare. You are listening to Your Health, and oddly enough, stay awake. We're talking about you and your sleep habits. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the sleep issues that really have a tendency to bring us down. And what does it take to get a good night's sleep. We'll find out in moments. Your health on KNSI. AM 1450 FM 99.3 KNSI. Your health with Dr. Troy Payne, neurologist with CentraCare. Been there for a long time, specializing now in sleep and sleep issues. Well, Dr. Troy Payne, what are some of those sleep issues? What keeps us from getting a good night's sleep? Well, the top three things that I see are insomnia, restless leg syndrome, and sleep apnea. Let's start with that very first one, uh, insomnia. What's keeping us up? Our jobs, our kids, uh, light, uh, cell phones in the bedroom at night. We've got people who are on their laptops uh, in bed at night saying they can't go to sleep while staring at a blue screen at 1 in the morning. Those blue <laughs> screens are a problem. They, they fake your brain out. It thinks it's 1 in the afternoon, not 1 in the morning. And is it the blue that does that? It is. It's light total and then also the blue wavelength. Uh, what about, I always hear about people sleeping with a night light on. Yeah, and a night light's fine if you need a little one around the corner, out of the way, mm-hmm. just for safety so you don't trip on something getting to the bathroom at night. But you don't want a bright light at night. Light makes your brain think it's daytime and you won't go to sleep as well. What do we do for insomnia? Get out of the bedroom? The biggest thing is to have about the same wake-up time every day. Because if your wake-up time varies a lot, your brain doesn't know when to go to sleep. Then pick a normal bedtime and don't put your bedtime and your wake time too far apart from each other or else you'll stretch your sleep out and it'll start breaking into pieces in the middle of the night. Okay. Then watch how much caffeine and alcohol you're drinking. Caffeine lasts about six hours. So a diet Pepsi at four or five, six o'clock, a lot of that's still in your system when you go to bed Yep. and alcohol will make you go to sleep faster, but it messes everything up with sleep. You'll get less deep sleep. You get more dream sleep at the end of the night. Weird dreams. Have to go to the bathroom more. There's really nothing good about alcohol and sleep. All right. What about a nice glass of warm milk? It doesn't help that much in the studies. It sometimes will help some people. 
if you got a little reflux or something, milk or something to settle that down. And actually, we actually often recommend somebody have a, a little cookie or a cracker, a little bowl of cereal or something like that in the evening, um, but just not a big meal right before you go to bed. Something in the tummy is not the worst idea? It's not the worst idea. All right. I believe the second thing that you uh, had mentioned was restless leg syndrome? It's very common. If you just ask, about 10% of people have it on occasion, and about 3% of people have it almost every night. Restless leg is an irresistible urge to move your legs. It's worse at night, right when you want to go to sleep, and it runs in families quite often. All you got to do is get up and walk around, and it usually gets better, but you can't walk around all night. Right. So... What we always do with that is uh, first make sure there's nothing else that's causing it. Then you check an iron level because low iron levels make it worse. Then you look at the medicines that you're on. Certain over-the-counter things like Benadryl can make it worse. Certain prescription medicines like Prozac can make it worse. And then there's four FDA-approved medications to help it if you need to take a medicine for it. Can you tell me if restless legs uh, can affect somebody sometimes if they're just sitting there on the couch? Yes. In fact, most people will say that they start getting the feeling like they have got to move their legs sometime oh man, after legs supper. Just take right off sometimes, just a kick. Oh, yeah. If you don't move them, sometimes they'll move on their own. Right, right. And even when you're asleep, you can be kicking. So sometimes your bed partner will tell yeah. you, oh, my gosh, you were terrible last night. Usually mine is yelling at me, Bob, stop snoring. That's usually the problem, <laughs> which uh, opens up the door to sleep apnea, the third thing that you talked about that causes people uh, to lose sleep. Yeah, we were talking earlier, both your and Mike Beards have long turned gray. <laughs> so amongst those of us of that generation, about 50% of guys and about 30% of women snore nightly. That's a large number of people. Most of those people don't have sleep apnea. Sleep okay. apnea is different. Sleep apnea is where your tongue falls back, the walls cave in in your upper throat, and you just can't get air down. And that's bad that's because if you can't get oxygen down to your heart and to your brain – it increases the risk of heart attack and stroke. You know, I've never understood how that can happen because try doing that while you're awake. You can't do it. It's hard. I, I, I can imitate a snore yeah. and I can try to imitate an apnea when I've got people in the office. And sometimes they'll say, yep, that's what he does. But, you know, it's so much easier when you're sleeping because you're relaxed and all those muscles just collapse. Okay. Does sleep apnea uh, really cause the biggest problem if you're extremely tired? No, it causes the biggest problem if you're extremely overweight because the higher you weigh, the more likely you are to develop sleep apnea. Or if both your mom and dad had it, you're just more likely to get it. You know, I sure see an awful lot of people in the morning, they've got those telltale marks uh, along either side of their cheeks, right? Is that from that uh, the CPAP machine being held in place? Yeah, there's a variety of different ways to try to open the airway up. One of those is CPAP. I tell people when you take your glasses off, it's normal to have that little indentation on the tip of your nose where those little nose pieces sat. And it's normal when you first take your CPAP mask off to have a little bit of a mark there. But by the time you get to work, that should be gone. Yep. If If you're still seeing that and it's lunchtime, that mask is too tight. Maybe you need a different mask, a different headgear, something new. Well, Doc, what do we do for, you know, I just can't get to sleep at night. I have insomnia. I have restless legs. I suffer from sleep apnea. What are the answers? Talk to your family doctor. I mean, family doctors are fantastic at working it all through all of these things. And if the family doctor needs a little help, then they send them to us. So we see people every day in the clinic. We've got three docs, three nurse practitioners, wonderful staff of very caring, nice sure. people. Now, do you work specifically at the uh, at the sleep clinic? Yeah, we have the a sleep clinic here in St. Cloud that is by Clara's House, right. sort of behind the plaza near the Sauk River. But we also go to a variety of different places outside of uh, St. Cloud also. So many people just take it for granted, right? Uh, they wake up in the morning, ah, I didn't sleep so, go- so well last night, no big deal. But it really is a big deal, isn't it? It is, and it's funny. I've got couples where... One of them just sleeps like you wouldn't believe, no trouble at all. And the other one has insomnia and restless legs and all kinds of problems. And it's just so annoying to be with somebody who sleeps so great when you're staring at the clock and can't go to sleep and your legs are bothering you or having trouble. Well, folks, if you have some sleep issues, uh, stay with us because we're going to talk about what you can do. Maybe you've got some 
bad habits. Uh, Maybe you're eating too much too late or what have you. But we'll find out what we need to do. Dr. Troy Payne, neurologist with CentraCare. We're talking about you and your sleep habits. It's your health on KNSI. AM 1450 FM 99.3 KNSI. Welcome back to your health. Today's guest health expert from CentraCare is neurologist Dr. Troy Payne. We're talking about sleep habits and sleep issues. Doc, uh, would it be good uh, to maybe think about a sleep diary or something like that? If I if I'm having problems, just write things down. What I did during the day, maybe the time that I did this or ate that or drank the other thing, something like that. That's a fantastic idea. I tell people, no matter what you've got, when you go see the doctor, write something down. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's 13 pages long, the doctor might not have time to read the whole thing sitting there with you. But if you could write on a piece of paper, you know, I went to bed at this time. I got up at that time. But in the middle of the night, I was up here and here and I had trouble here. And if you just write that down for a week and you walk in the door and say, this is what my last week was like. This was bad. I need to do something about this. Boy, that's really, really helpful to your doc. I would imagine that would you would just say, oh, I can pinpoint the problem right here, or this is that, and this is causing the other factor. Sometimes. Right. Sometimes we can just look at that and go, well, you're going to bed at 8 o'clock, and you're getting up at 6. Can you sleep 10 hours? And they go, no, I'm only sleeping 5. I'm up between 1 and 4 every morning. And I go, well, you know, if you can't sleep 10 hours, you're probably going to bed too early or getting, you know, going to bed uh, too early or getting up too late. Mm-hmm. So we need to work on your timing. And then other people all write down, you know, uh, legs were jerking, can't fall asleep, had, had to get up and walk around again. You know, th- that's really helpful. What is a typical visit uh, like when I come see Dr. Troy Payne? Do you, do you expect uh, clients, patients to have this, this kind of stuff written down? Or uh, how, would the, how would the visit go back and forth between you and myself? When we're seeing somebody for the first time, we actually have a four-page questionnaire that goes over really? a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. Okay. So it sort of cues people in to go through all of these things. Are they a little surprised at four pages? It is, but it's not that bad. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, there is four pages of different stuff that we ask. Uh, how's your heart? Mm-hmm. How are your legs? You know, how's your breathing? Do you have asthma? Do you have COPD? Um, what kind of medicines are you on? You know, what time do you go to bed? What time do you get up? What bothers you about your sleep? And then what is someone you're sleeping with complaining about? Because mm, that's really go. important. A witness. I tell you, it's worth <laughs> its weight in gold if a bed partner comes to the sleep clinic appointment because they know things that the person who's sitting in the chair next to me won't admit to or doesn't know. Yeah, because they're sleeping. How they're would they sleeping. know, right? They will know. Wow. Uh, boy, that could be a cause for some conversation later, I bet. <laughs> Dr. Payne, um, when do we know that it's time to come see you? What are some of the symptoms of, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm tired. Uh, I need an alarm to haul my carcass out of bed in the morning, that sort of thing. Are those are those signs that you may not be getting enough rest? If you need an alarm to wake you up every morning and you're tired when that alarm goes off, you're not getting enough sleep or the sleep isn't very good. Okay. It's one or the other. You really should be able to wake up spontaneously about the time you need, except if you have to get up at, you know, before three in the morning to run a radio show. Yeah. But for most people, what I tell people is try to get enough sleep on a regular schedule. And if you wake up and you're still tired, go talk to somebody. Yeah. The worst thing you can do is tough it out. Sure. Without ever talking to somebody. What kind of things would our kids present? What kind of symptoms would they present as far as, you know, junior high, maybe grade school or senior high kids? Some of the high schoolers uh, have an issue where that normal go to want to go to bed later and get up later gets to be extreme. So I'm forever seeing teenage boys who can't possibly go to sleep before three in the morning and can't get up before noon. Which sounds causes, like a little fortnight to me. Uh, yeah. So, you know, is it a. Is it a circadian problem that's gone awry? Is it that they're setting up playing video games? I mean, what is going on? Right. And so we work with these kids a lot because, of course, they get into academic trouble at school. They get into truancy issues with school. Do kids understand why this is so important and why, like, do they think they're being punished for something? If they're not taught, they don't know. Yeah. And so it's one of those things as a parent, you, you try to teach about decent exercise, you try to teach about, you know, decent nutrition, and I think we should teach our kids about decent sleep, too. 
about daylight saving time. Which is harder on people, springing forward or falling back? It's springing forward that's harder because most people will lose sleep. On average, people lose about 40 minutes of sleep. I'll just go to bed an hour earlier. Well, that doesn't work, does it? No, they can't go to sleep. Or people keep up and do things, and then they get up at the new time, and now they've lost sleep. And it's hard on us. It actually is. There have been many studies that show as much as a 25% increase in heart attack and about a 8 to 10% increase in stroke the day after right. we have this time change. Everybody likes getting an extra hour of sleep in the fall. Boy, that sounds good. <laughs> but an hour less in the spring is a little bit hard on us. Dr. Troy Payne, are you accepting patients now at oh, Centric yeah. Care all we, the time? Yeah, we take people every single day. Do I need a referral from someone? Nope, not unless your insurance requires it. Okay. And most insurances don't these days. All right, so how do I get in touch with Dr. Troy Payne at Centric Care? The uh, St. Cloud Hospital Sleep Center is at uh, 320-251-0726. We're right beside Clara's house by the Salk River behind the plaza. And if, if somebody would just like to maybe take a little check on themselves, just coming up with that sleep diary, and they may be able to solve some of their own problems, I bet. I bet so. And you can always talk to your family doctor about these things, too. Uh, they can really be helpful at trying to help you through some of this. And if they need help, then they just refer to us, or you can call us, and we do self-referrals all the time. Very good. Dr. Troy Payne, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. AM 1450, FM 99.3, KNSI. Neurologist Dr. Troy Payne with Center Care. And you have been listening to Your Health on KNSI. <laughs>